we've got to form new habits. If we're serious about moving past our past, we have to form new habits. You know why? Because we don't really rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our habits. <laughs> we're in a series called Rise Up, and we're talking about the fact that Easter weekend wasn't just for Easter weekend. The resurrection power wasn't just for Jesus. That when we invite Christ into our lives, that he brings his spirit. He wants to empower our lives. Being a Christian is not just believing in God and trying to do better. Being a believer is receiving all that God has to live out the purpose that he has for our lives. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Can I hear you say that verse, church? Look at it right here. Here we got it. You ready? The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Somebody say it lives in me. Lives in Amen. Right here. God's Spirit. And so what we're talking about in the series is, what does that mean? Kind of like, so what? Kind of like, so what does that mean in my life? Well, God wants to empower us to rise up from some of the shadows in our lives. Last week, we talked about that we could rise up from fear and worry, negativity and doubt. Today, I wanna to talk about rising up from our hurts and our habits and our hangups. Rising up to a place of freedom in our lives. You know, we have these four words out at the back when you leave, you'll see them on the wall. Know God, find freedom, discover your purpose and make a difference. You might have wondered, what is that? That's the spiritual journey of growth that all of us are on. We're somewhere on this chart here. In other words, God doesn't just want me to say, all right, I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life, and that's it. In other words, he wants us to know God. He wants us to have an intimate relationship with God. He's to have some daily devotional time and learn how to receive the word in your life and learn how to pray, learn how to walk in faith. But it goes beyond that. When we get saved, the Bible says we're instantly forgiven we're made a new creation in christ god puts his spirit on the inside of us but you know we still have issues in our lives right just because you decided to follow jesus it doesn't mean you're automatically healed from all the wounds from your past sometimes we have issues from the junk that we've gone through sometimes we have habits and patterns that are destructive to our lives that's why the second point is really where we're hanging today god wants us not only to know him but to find freedom from those things in our life that hold us back, to find freedom from the hurts from the past, to find freedom from the hang-ups, to find freedom from the habits that are destructive in our lives. And then God wants us to go on and discover that we have a purpose, that there's a gift and a calling inside of every believer, not just pastors, not just leaders, that God has put a purpose for each and every one of us. And when we live out the purpose that God has for us, we will make a difference in other people's lives. Today, I want to talk to you about by God's spirit and by God's power rising up into a place of freedom past the hurts, the habits, and the hang-ups of your life. Let's pray. Lord, we pray today that as we open the scriptures and get into the word of God, that the Holy Spirit, your best friend, cause the words of God to come alive on the inside of us let there be a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Let, let there be some eye-opening moments today for every person. Fill your people with faith. Fill us with courage. Fill us with wisdom, with your power in Jesus' name. And everyone said, there was a book a few years ago called Change or Die. And it was some studies. It was by Alan Deutschman. And he talked about the plight of heart disease patients. He talked about that weird moment when doctors have to have a conversation with their patients that is really should be shocking. It is designed to be life-changing. When a doctor sits down with a patient on the other side of the desk and says, if you don't change the way you're living, you're going to die. In other words, if you don't change your lifestyle, the food you're taking in or the way you move around or your sleep habits, if you don't change, something really bad is going to happen. Now, you would think that is a totally life, like, man, after that, everything's different. For some people, it is. But Dr. Ed Miller, the CEO of John Hopkins, said that now they found this, that even after major heart surgery, they've done study after study, two years afterwards, 
Most of the people, actually, can I tell you what they say? 90% of people have not changed their eating habits or their lifestyle even after major heart surgery two years later. What is wrong with us, right? There's a disconnect. Why is it that we humans, we do things that we know are hurting us, yet somehow we're not able to stop. That's why we're talking today about getting past our hurts and habits and hangups because we all have issues in our lives. What's your issue today? What do you need healing from? What habit do you need to break? What destructive pattern is in your life that you're doing it, you know it's bad, you know it's hurting you, it might be hurting others as well, but somehow we just don't find the power, the strength to overcome it. Maybe you're the person who consistently turns to drugs or drinking to medicate your disappointment in life. Maybe you're the person that after everyone eats, you secretly go to the bathroom to throw up because you have this really self-image issue and you, you, you have these, you know, this paranoid, this fear about how you look. Maybe you're a person that runs to food every time there's stress and food is, is like the new drug. Maybe you're the guy that looks at pornography in the dark of the night and no one knows. Maybe it's even more hidden than that. Maybe you're a person who is just bound by this sense where you have to judge other people and you have this negativity where you're criticizing others and you're full of bitterness or maybe you're criticizing yourself and you have these high expectations and you're, you're expecting perfection. Could be that you abuse credit cards, that you, know, you have a secret credit card and, and it, there's all kinds of things. I mean, here's the truth of it today, all right? Because we know there's no perfect people in this room. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I kind of like how John Maxwell says it. You got issues, I got issues. All God's children have issues, right? And if you don't think you got issues, that's your issue. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm, I'm fine, man. And so Andy Stanley, he has a book called um, Enemies of the Heart. And he talks about the emotions that we can live out, the negative emotions that can drive addiction, they can drive the, the negative destructive patterns. He talks about that sometimes we live out of guilt, which is what he calls the IOU emotion. And from a place of guilt, we can create some really weird patterns in our life. Sometimes we live out of a place of anger, which is you owe me. We can live out of the emotion of greed, which is I owe me. Or we can live out of the emotion of jealousy, which is God owes me. He goes on to say in his book that these emotions, if we live inside of these, they, they don't just hurt us, they can kill us. They can bring destruction to areas of our life, our family, our homes, our, our friends. They can destroy our witness. And so a lot of times when you know, someone says, man, what's your issue? What we want to do is we want to look at other people and go, well, I don't know, but you know, let me tell you what their issue is. I can tell you, hey, how much time you got? Let me tell you all about them, right? But the first step to freedom in our lives to get past our hurts, our habits, our hangups is to name our issue. Because the things that are hidden have the most power over us. As one person said, you're only as sick as your secrets. There's a reason why the first step in 12-step programs is Admit your need. Admit you're powerless to do this thing in your own strength. But there's another step, and that is you need a higher power. You need someone greater than you that will come into your life, that will help you break through these areas that are holding you back in your life. I want to tell you today that God wants you free. Jesus said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. In Christ, there's freedom for you. In Christ, there's power for you. In Christ, you're made new. In Christ, you're filled with his spirit. In Christ, you're the righteousness of God. We have a choice as believers. We can walk in the virtuous cycle or we can walk in the vicious cycle of life. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In other words, when we fail, when we sin, when we miss the mark and we know we do, we don't serve a God who pushes our face down into the dirt and says, I see what you did and pushes us down even further. No, God says there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Verse 2 says, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. There is a law that's greater than the law of sin and death. It's the law of the spirit of life. And that's the thing that can interrupt the destructive patterns. Listen, you've been empowered with something greater as we learn to tap into it. We can walk in that virtuous cycle. What is that cycle? It's when I have spiritual disciplines in my life. It's when I have healthy patterns. 
It's when I'm pursuing God and I have some devotional time and I'm allowing his spirit and his character to grow in my life. And now I have the, uh, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. That's available to every believer. That's, that's the stuff that should be growing in us. Or we can choose to live in the vicious cycle. The vicious cycle is just the opposite. It's when I've got bad patterns. I'm not connecting with Christ. I'm not abiding in the word. And, and I don't have the fruits of the spirit. I'm, I'm walking in my flesh and there's selfishness and bitterness and bad patterns and addictions. And things can go from bad to worse. Today, we're going to look at a story in the New Testament where Jesus interrupted a pattern. He's going into a town and he meets a guy who's an invalid and has been for 38 years. And we're going to find out today that when Jesus is in the house, all things are possible to him who believes. We're going to find out today that we can interrupt the patterns and we can move into a place of freedom. Let's look at the story. John chapter 5. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda. Had five covered porches. Crowds of sick people were around these porches. They were blind, lame, paralyzed. They lay on the porches. Next verse. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years, and Jesus saw him. He knew it had been a long time, and he asked him, would you like to get well? Verse 7 says, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat, and he began walking. What this guy found out is... You can have a pattern, you can have a, a paralysis, you can have something holding you back for even decades that you've thought, man, I wish I could stop doing this. I wish I could break free from this in my life. I wish I could break free from that pain, that hurt, that habit, that addiction. But when Jesus is there, all things are possible. Let me give you three things from this story that will help us rise up into a place of freedom in our life. Number one, your issue is not your identity. Your issue is not your identity. Notice that in this story, this guy's not even given a name. It's just there was a guy there who had been paralyzed for 38 years. He, was, he, he, did, he couldn't walk for 38 years. In other words, his issue is his identity. That's what we get, right? And you might think, man, Jesus walks up to him. And, man, who walks up to someone like that and says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? Right? Now, I have a great message today for anyone that wants to be well. I really don't have a message for people that don't want to be well. Jesus said, do you want to be well? Why did he ask that? Because he knew this is this guy's identity. It's how he, it, it was his seat in society. And it was how he got sympathy. It was his job, his livelihood, his income. And Jesus poses this question, do you want to be well? And the guy doesn't say yes. He doesn't say, yes, I do. He says, well, I, I can't because, and, and he begins to, to give excuses. And he begins to say, this is why I can't. And what we find many times is, you know, addiction and things like that, there can be many different areas. It can be physiological, it can be, you know, mental, it can be uh, epi epigenetical, uh, all kinds of things. But many times what we find is bondage in our lives can be a mindset that we've bought into. The scripture talks about these things called strongholds says the weapons of our warfare are not natural weapons, but they're mighty to pull down strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's like a fortress of thought in our minds. It's like the lies of the enemy that have built a barrier around us. And when we don't believe we can break through that barrier, then we're never going to break through that barrier. In other words, it's not physical fences. It's mental fences. I've got great news today. You've got power in Jesus' name to tear down the strongholds in your life. How do they begin? Well, it can begin with a losing streak that just takes you into a defeated mentality. That defeated mentality can lead us into self-talk where our self-talk is always like, you know what, you're never going to get this. You're, you're too weak. You're not enough. You're not good enough. God doesn't love you. You're power. I'm an addict. I'll always be an addict. I'm this. I'll, always, I'll never break through. And you have that negative self-talk in your life, and it just becomes normal. You just begin to buy into who you are. You begin to buy into your issues, and you're like, well, I guess this is who I am. In fact, you know, sin, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why Jesus came. And before Christ, in the book of Leviticus, we see that bondage was becoming very, very normal. And Moses sends out, and, and God tells Moses in Leviticus chapter 4, he says, listen, we're going to have sacrifice for all kinds of sin. 
We're going to have a sacrifice for people that sin in the community. We're going to have a sacrifice for the people for, that sin outside of the community. We're going to have a sacrifice for people for the whole community. And so he listed out all these sacrifices for the different sins. And then it became so normal that God said this. He put this plan in motion. Okay, so when people come and they, they've failed, they've sinned, and they make a sacrifice, that's going to be what the priest eats that day. In other words, the, the sacrifice, the animal they offer, that's the diet of the priest now. Okay? I have just one question. How large did those priests get? Come on, somebody. <laughs> because how do you know? We can fail a lot, right? In other words, it became so normal. Can you imagine the priest in training? I mean, you know, they're like, hey, how'd you do today? I had five steaks for breakfast. This is getting crazy. I don't know how you guys do this. But they could dominate in an eating contest, right? Let me ask you a question today. Has your issue become your identity? Has your issue become so normal that it is your expectation that you're always going to fail in this area of life? Psychologist Dr. Martin Lockman is coined a phrase called learned helplessness. And part of it's from a 1967 study at University of Pennsylvania where they would take sets of dogs in harnesses and they would run a little electrical shock to these dogs. I know dog lovers, you're like, oh, and, but, you know, apparently it was approved. So uh, it didn't hurt them, really. Um, but it, was, it did let them know something was wrong. Now, one of the dogs in the harness system had a lever that if you push that lever, it would stop the current from going through. And then another dog on the other side had a lever that was a dummy lever. If you push the lever, nothing happened. So they fired up this test, and, and the one dog learns, man, I can stop this current by uh, hitting this lever right here and the other dog's got this dummy lever he's hitting it over and over nothing's happening N know what happened next they switched the dogs they put the dog that had the dummy lever over on the power lever and the power lever to the dummy lever you know what happened to the guy with the well the dog <laughs> the dog with the power lever you know what happened to him he never pushed the lever because he was so used to nothing happening with the dummy lever he just figured I'm powerless to do anything. And then you would just kind of lay down and whine until the experiment was over. And that's the power of learned helplessness. In other words, let me ask you this question. What area in life have you just learned helplessness? After 38 years, this guy was like, this is just my life. This is what I am. This is who. What has become your identity? Proverbs 27 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I've got great news for somebody today. When you come to Christ, God doesn't see you as your issue. He knows we need help. He knows we need his power. But you know what happens? When you come to Christ, you get a new identity. You are a new creation in Christ. You're adopted into the family of God now. You're made in the image of God. You're an overcomer in Christ. In fact, the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. Guys, you're warriors for God. You're sons of the living God. That's what the Bible says about us. Ladies, you are daughters of the king. You're royalty. God sees you. And in 1 Peter, it says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood called to show forth the praises of God. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin so we could become the righteousness of God. Just like that prodigal son, when he came back from eating with the pigs and eating pig slop, he came back home. The father put a robe on him and the family ring and said, this is my son that's come home. He wasn't looking at the dirt. He said, no, you're a part of the family. Can we give God some praise today? Because we don't have to earn our way. He sees you as royalty now. He sees you as his son. He sees you as his daughter. You're made in his image. And I want to tell you, you are more than a conqueror in Christ. And that's how we begin to live in victory. We begin to live in the identity God has for us. We admit without him, we're nothing. But you know what? With him, I have power to overcome in every area of my life. Here's the second thing we see in this story. Number two, God is bigger than your bondage. God is bigger than your bondage. I hope that doesn't sound trite because it's true. God is bigger than your bondage. What he didn't know was he was in the presence of the power of God. Jesus told the family of Lazarus, I am the resurrection. I am the life. If you believe in me, even though you were dead, you'll live. You see, 
He was trying to explain to Jesus his impossibilities, and Jesus was right there trying to offer him what was possible. Jesus said to someone else in the New Testament, he said, hey, listen, all things are possible to him who believes. When Jesus was about to do miracles in people's lives, he would say, do you believe that I can do this? There's this power, there's this bridge, there's this pathway for God's strength to flow through us. It's called faith. It's called believing. Hebrews says, Faith is now the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. We have a choice today when we face mountains, when we face challenges, when we face the problems from our past, and that is that you can put your circumstances between you and God, or you can put God between you and your circumstances. Faith is not about what you can achieve. Faith is about what you can believe, and then God will help you to receive that. Jesus interrupted this guy's pattern. The power of God was right in front of him. And Jesus said something that was shocking to him. Jesus looks at him when he's saying, I can't because of this and that, and I can't. And that. Jesus says, stand up. Wow. I bet you no one had ever said that to him before. Stand up. And it says, the guy stood up. The power of God healed his life. Jesus interrupted his pattern. I want to tell you today, somebody here, you've thought, I can never break the patterns, the negativity, the addictions, the habits, the hurts, the wounds. But listen, when you pursue God, I, listen, when you pursue the presence of God, he was in the presence of the king. He was in the presence of the power of God. Every time you come into this house and worship, you invite God's presence into your life. God's spirit's in all of us, but something happens when you worship the Lord that doesn't happen at any other time. In Psalms, it says he inhabits the praises of his people. When you worship God, you create a place for the Holy Spirit to come and be stronger in your life. Do you want more of God's power? Do you want more of God's strength? When you pursue him, when you put your eyes on him, when you focus, the old song says, turn your eyes on Jesus. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim. We create a house. We create an atmosphere for God's power. I believe we're living in a day where we'll see the power of God move in our lives and in our families and in our community and in our city. If you believe it, come on, give God a praise today. If you believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pursue God in your worship. Invite more of him into your life. And then the third thing we see in this story, and that is this. Because there was a process. Jesus told him to stand up and something happened. The third thing we see in this story is focus on the process. Focus on the process. Most of the time, the stuff in our lives was a process that got us into the things. And usually it's a process that will get us out. Now, God can bring an instant deliverance. But many times he chooses to let us walk through in faith, hearing the word of God, pursuing his presence, learning to live in my new identity because our spiritual faith muscles grow. There's a process for you today for wholeness. There's a process for healing. There's a process for freedom. Where are you at in that process today? See, part of the process is finding your place where you spend the first 15 minutes with God and get the word of God in your life. Begin to believe who God says you are. Invite his power. Begin to pursue him in worship. I'm not talking about an hour or two hours. I'm talking about like spend 15 minutes with God. Come on the weekends expecting to hear from God. I want to tell you, I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years or 15 minutes. If you come on the weekend expecting God's going to do something in my life, I promise you, your expectation will draw God to you today. Right now, any service, 9.30, 5 o'clock Saturday, 11.15, you come, God, I think you're going to do something. I'm going to worship you this weekend. I'm going to hear your word, and your word is alive, and you're moving in my life. There's a process in our lives. Sometimes that process means that we need counseling. Sometimes that process for some of us might mean we need a clinic. But we all can take a next step to wherever we're at. And many times it's a small step that leads to a giant leap that is part of your journey to mental health and spiritual health and emotional health. We're all in a process. I love Hebrews chapter 10. Check this out. Hebrews chapter 10 is a little picture of what I'm talking about today. For by one sacrifice, that's Jesus, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I love that verse because it gives us the power of the instantaneousness of our forgiveness and God makes us brand new in Christ. 
the moment we follow Jesus, the moment we say yes to Jesus, you know what? It says he has made. Somebody say has made. Has made. Perfect forever. When you come to Christ, God declares you righteous. He says he's made you perfect forever. Turn to your neighbor and say, hello, perfect person. Feels weird, doesn't it? Because we know we're not. But you know what? On the inside, God sees you as his righteousness. God sees you as his son and daughter. So in one sense, right? In one sense, spiritually, you have been made perfect. On the inside, you look like Christ. On the inside, all of the fruit of the spirit is already there. Yet we know on the outside, we got issues. We got problems. I got hurts. I got habits. I got hangups. Oh, guess what? God doesn't leave you alone in that. He says, oh, yeah. And you are also being made holy. It's called sanctification. It's called allowing the character of Christ to grow on the inside of me. To where the old things in my life begin to pass away. And now I begin to allow his fruit, the spirit of God, I begin to allow him to rise up in me. And I can overcome the hurts and the habits and the issues of my past. I've got to learn just to focus on the process. Let me give you two more here. And then I'm going to read you a really powerful story. I also want you to find your family. Part of the process is getting a crew around you that will help you on your spiritual journey. It's why we do small groups at church. It's why we have connect class. It's why we have new people's party. It's because we know that this is not a solo sport. This is not a Lone Ranger thing to do. It's that you and I, we need people in our journey that we can share our hurts and our habits with, that they can be a blessing, they can pray for us, be a strength. I'm not saying you need to tell all your problems to everybody or announce it on a public PA system. But you do need somebody in your life that's trustworthy. You need a group of people that you can say, guys, I'm, I'm struggling with this thing in my life today. I need you to help me. Because in the book of James, it says, when we confess our sins to God, you know what we get? Forgiveness. Confess your sins to God and you'll be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and you'll be healed. God has put the power of healing in community. He's put the power of healing when we partner with other people and something happens in these groups. That's why we get incredible stories and testimonies from our freedom class, from our small groups, from the even the friends and family groups that are fellowshipping where people say, man, I found family. I found freedom. See, God can instantly deliver us, but he often uses process. We've got to focus on the process. We've got to find our family. One more thing, we've got to form new habits. If we're serious about moving past our past, we have to form new habits. You know why? Because we don't really rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our habits. In other words, if your goal this year is you want to read 10 books this year, and you go, man, my goal, I'm going to read 10 books this year. You don't rise to the level of that goal. You fall to the level of your daily habits. So it needs to be, okay, well, here's my habit. I'm going to read two chapters a day. Right? I'm going to read one chapter, I'm going to read five. whatever it is. We don't rise to our goals. We fall to our daily habits. Some of you need to start the habit of spending the first 15 minutes with God. Five minutes of worship, five minutes of Bible reading, five minutes of prayer. If you can't do that, start with five minutes. Start somewhere. When you interrupt your, your habits, your current habits form. My doctor told me I needed to interrupt a habit recently. I'm a big, I like eggs in the morning. Anybody like eggs, right? I've been eating eggs since I was a teenager. I would eat 12 eggs for breakfast when I was 15 years old. Come on, where's my protein people, okay? Okay, both of us, me and you. Okay, so anyway, rest of people are different. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, usually eat two to three eggs every morning, have forever, love protein in the morning. But he's like, Mark, your cholesterol is, you know, jumping up there a little bit. You need to change your habits. You need to change your habit. He didn't say, you know, just have a goal. He said, you need to change your habits. And so I went from having, you know, 14 to 20 eggs a week to having four. And I said, hello to oatmeal. Come on, right? <laughs> I was like, hello, oatmeal. How are you? Right? Hey, wow, that's fantastic. Oatmeal. It's a good thing. It's like, I remember oatmeal now. Focus on the process. Find your family. That's why you're here today. God had you here. You're in the right place at the right time. God wants to bring new life into your life and form new habits. Form the habit of coming to church on the weekend. Form the habit of getting in a small group. Form the habit of spending the first 15 minutes with God. Interrupt your patterns that are wrong because deliverance has to be backed up with discipline. There is a king who reigns in victory.